Welcome to First Baptist Port Charlotte's online media. We hope this message will inspire you to draw nearer to God, connect with His family, and share your faith. Well, good morning. I invite you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 3. 200 million Christians this year experienced significant persecution because of their faith in Jesus Christ. About 60% of those were children. I trust you know that in many countries of the world, uh, it is illegal to witness and share your faith. It's illegal to have a Bible or to distribute Christian literature. It's illegal to worship with others in the church of your choosing. It's illegal to teach children about Jesus Christ. And those who choose to break man's law to follow God's law are often persecuted. In fact, persecution is documented in about 131 countries of the world. These believers face the loss of their homes, their families, their livelihoods, their churches, and their freedoms. They're often thrown into prison or placed in camps. Sometimes they are even martyred for their faith in Christ. And if you've watched the internet, which I don't necessarily recommend, you'll see where ISIS is consistently, continually still beheading those who will not turn from Christianity and embrace Islam. To learn more about the persecuted church, go to persecution.com. If you want some materials, they're on the table in the lobby this morning. You need to be informed about this. In today's text, we come to the first recorded incident of persecution against the church after Jesus has risen from the dead. It takes place because a 40-year-old man or so, crippled from birth, has been healed. And so thousands have gathered before Peter and John to witness the miracle and to hear the explanation. So Peter witnesses to them. We're in Acts 3, 12. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one. That's a term for the Messiah. And you asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong, healed. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete miracle to him, as you can all see. Go to 19. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. And we talked about that Greek word last week. That means to be erased permanently. That times of refreshing, and that's a phrase for heaven, may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. So about 2,000 are saved, but the Jewish uh, leaders still refuse to believe. Uh, They're angry that the disciples are teaching about Jesus. They feel threatened that his name is being proclaimed, and so they're going to stop the disciples. And that brings us to our text this morning, Acts chapter 4. We're going verse by verse through the book of Acts. We're now in chapter 4, verse 1. And Luke begins by giving us the list of these men that come to arrest Peter and John. It's made up of the priests, and those were the 24 ordained men who served in the temple. 
the captain of the temple guard, that was like the chief of police, and the Sadducees, and that's one group of religious leaders of Judaism, came to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. So about three o'clock, Peter and John arrive. Silver and gold, we don't have what we have. We give to you in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. The crippled man who hasn't walked for over 40 years stands and walks. He jumps and leaps and praises God. People come running. Peter proclaims the gospel. And now they're following up with those that have responded or those that have questions. And in the midst of that ministry scene, this group came up to Peter and John. Now those Greek words mean suddenly with hostile intent. So they weren't coming to listen or to ask questions. They're coming to arrest them for what they're doing. And why is that? Verse 2, they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So this group was greatly disturbed. Those words mean they were worked up. They were hot. They were displeased. They were offended. And why is that? Well, because Peter and John were teaching the Jews who had come to the temple that Jesus Christ was God's promised Messiah. The religious leaders had made it clear they didn't believe that. And they didn't believe his claims to be the Savior. So they had him crucified. They nailed him to a cross. They killed him. But God used their ignorance and what they did to accomplish his sovereign plan of salvation. Christ died for our sins. And the proof was his resurrection from the dead. There were hundreds of witnesses that saw him over 40 days, but still the Sadducees refused to believe. Now, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And so it gave them a chance to rethink their position, but they still refused to believe. Have you ever thought that? If they would just see a miracle, then they would believe. I mean, if someone just rose from the dead, then they would come to faith in Christ. But you know, that isn't always the case. Even Jesus said that. Uh, if you recall the story of the rich man and Lazarus, at the judgment, the rich man died. He went to hell. Uh, Lazarus went to heaven. He's at Abraham's bosom. And there's this conversation that is recorded in this story. And, um, and the rich man is crying out to Abraham for his brother's souls. Send someone to them and warn them about this place so they won't come here. And Abraham responds, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be convinced even if someone should rise from the dead. So Jesus has risen from the dead, and still these religious Jews do not believe. And they don't want others to believe, so they're going to silence the apostles. Verse 3, so they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. Now, the Sanhedrin, that's the Roman-approved court of the day, didn't meet at night, so they took the men and they put them in jail. And these weren't comfortable jails with cots and televisions. Okay, these were very primitive uh, jails. It was not comfortable. It was difficult. It was dark. It was damp. And so there are put Peter and John. And that's lesson number one about being a witness for Christ. You need to be prepared for possible persecution. Paul wrote to Timothy, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. In the same way that people resist the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit is leading you, they will resist you. In the same way they reject Christ, when you speak of Christ, they will reject you because they are rejecting him. I want you to consider some scriptures. First of all, how will people persecute us? And Jesus said this, blessed are you when people hate you. You understand that when you become a Christian, some people will hate you because of your faith in Christ. They will exclude you. They will reject you. They will leave you out. They will revile you. They will speak cruelly about you. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Now, why 
will they do this? And here's Jesus' explanation in John 15. Jesus said, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of this world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of this world, therefore, that is why the world hates you. Remember what I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all of these things they will do on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. So why? Why does God allow it? Well, they will deliver you over to councils. You will be beaten in synagogues and you will bear, stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And that's exactly what we're going to see happen in our text this morning. So how do we react when we're persecuted? Well, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear his name. Do not be frightened of your opponents. Uh, look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Maintain a clear conscience so that when you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to their faithful creator and continue to do good. So what comforts us in persecution? Well, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or persecution or danger or the sword? Well, I'm convinced that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? You're with me. God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Therefore, I will say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? So that's the first lesson about witnessing. You need to be prepared that when you take a stand for Jesus Christ, you may be persecuted. Next, after noting what men did to Peter and John, Luke notes what God did to men. Look at four. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. So that's witnessing lesson number two. Tell them the message of the gospel. It's the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. Now, not everyone will believe, but that's not up to you. That's up to God. So when God prompts you and God opens a door, share the gospel. Uh, I was over here near Pineras, and I um, was speaking with an acquaintance. And in that conversation, we were talking about Christmas. And I find that Christmas is a great time to share the gospel. I say, well, so what does Christmas mean to you? And he said, well, you know, Christmas is about family. It's all about family and getting with those you love and spending time with them. And after he said that, I said, I, I, for some reason, I just had the grace just to lovingly say, can I just say that as wonderful it is to get with family at Christmas, Christmas is about Jesus Christ and his birth. That's what Christmas is really about. Do you, under, do you understand that? And then I went into a gospel that God created man and woman. He put them in the garden and they sinned. And from that moment, God promised he would send a savior to the world who would save us from our sins, who would forgive us for our sins. And so we waited. And when Christmas, what we celebrate is Jesus Christ, God's savior came to earth. He arrived. And that's what we're celebrating at Christmas, that God promised Savior arrived, and he was Christ the Lord. And he lived a perfect life, and then he died on the cross, and he shed his blood, and he paid for our sins so that we could be forgiven and have a relationship with God. I said, and I said his name, I said, that's what Christmas is about. 
And then it came time for our conversation to end and wondering if I had alienated him. And I said, well, you know, thanks. It was good talking with you. And I said, listen, if you want to talk more, uh, let me know. And he said, here's my business card. Call me. I said, I will. He said, you know, when I was 18, I, I grew up in the Catholic church and my father died and I left. And for 30 years, I haven't really even thought about God. But... I'm thinking now. I said, oh, God's drawing you. I said, we will talk. I'm telling you, beloved, there will be opportunities. There are some people that are hardened, disinterested, but there are others that the Spirit of God is drawing. Be alert to those opportunities and tell them. Here's what Paul wrote in Romans 10. How then can they, they call on the one they've not believed? How do they believe in him they've not heard? How do they hear without someone preaching? How do they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring or preach the good news. So with your words, with your Facebook writings, with your emails and your texts and your cards, tell people the good news. Oh, everyone knows. You know, it's amazing how they don't. Or they forget, I was reminded as I'm talking with this very intelligent man that the God of this age, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. They can't see. And so many times we think they can see. No, many times they, they're blinded. They can't see. But you then begin to speak and God might use your words to open their eyes so they can see. Verse 5. The next day, the group gathers the Sanhedrin made up of rulers, elders, teachers of the law. They met there in Jerusalem. Annas, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, other men of the high priest's family. So that's the Sanhedrin, and that's like our Supreme Court. We have nine, they had 71. And so these 71 gather. Most of them are Sadducees, which is sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection from the dead. So Peter and John kind of have the deck stacked against them. And uh, so the odds of them giving justice aren't good. And so Luke mentions the members, uh, the rulers, those are the chief priests, the elders, those are the heads of families and tribes, the teachers of the law, those are Pharisees, uh, the scribes, the legal or law experts, and Annas was the former high priest. Caiaphas, his son-in-law, is the acting high priest. John and Alexander, those are key leaders. And then all who were of priestly descent, kind of the elite of the day from which the high priest was chosen. So this impressive group of respected men gather, and they bring in these unlearned men from Galilee. And look at seven. They had Peter and John brought before them, and they began to question them. And that's witnessing lesson number three. Persecution often brings divine opportunities. Now, here's what we know from historical context. If Peter and John had made a request of the Sanhedrin and said, can we come and speak before you, they would have been absolutely denied. That would not have happened. But because of the miracle, because of the persecution... They are then brought before the Sanhedrin and God has orchestrated an opportunity for the gospel to be presented. And I want you to know you have found God does the same thing with you and me. He engineers circumstances, sometimes situations we would never choose. Sometimes they're difficult life circumstances and he does it to put us with someone that we might never speak with otherwise. And it's God's way of getting us in contact with them so that we will share the gospel with them. And so our part is not to react to the difficulties, but to see God's hand in them orchestrating our lives. So look what the Supreme Court of the day asks them. Seven, by what power or what name do you do this? Well, that's pretty amazing. It's like, wow, the scene is set and they now have an opportunity to share. The men are listening, and look at eight. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. And so that's witnessing lesson number four. Prepare yourself, and then trust the Holy Spirit to give you the words to say. Here's what Jesus promised in Luke 12. When they bring you before the synagogues, 
and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. And that's exactly what happened. So look how the Holy Spirit led him to speak. Look at verse 8. Rulers and elders of the people. So he begins by acknowledging their authority. Now why do you think they did that? Well, I believe the reason he did it is because they think, you're a troublemaker. You're a rebel. You're a problem. And he comes by being respectful. And so he calls them by the title of the day, and he takes a humble posture, and he acknowledges their authority. And I'm convinced when you and I share in a respectful manner, that really it disarms those that might be prepared to react against us. And so ultimately, we're under God's authority, but we're also put under human authority. And so we show respect for them. Uh, Romans 13, 7, pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes, uh, to whom taxes are owed, respect. To whom respect is owed, honor. To whom honor is owed. So Peter comes with this humble, respectful attitude, and then he answers their question. Look at 9. If we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and were asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all who live in Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Now, I want to take just a moment and acknowledge our witnessing lesson number six. Be gracious and clear. It's interesting, those words called to account means examined, investigated. Wow. <laughs> what a gracious way to put it. You, could, you jerks, you don't have authority to do that. You put us in jail overnight. You are mistreating us. I'm calling my lawyer. I can't believe you did this to us. <laughs> I mean... Instead, it's like, listen, if we're being called to a kid, you're investigating a situation, so let me answer what you're investigating. And I'm thinking, wow, what a kind response. What a gracious way to respond. Because the reality is, you're going to have people that will mistreat you. They'll speak disrespectfully about you. And you either react and get them riled up and have this negative encounter, or you take a humble posture, you express a gracious attitude, and then you answer the question or explain the situation as is appropriate. And so let me tell you this. In the midst of witnessing, don't get bitter, don't get critical, don't get haughty. But at the same time, notice what he says. He, he gives them a reasonable answer uh, and helps them to understand that what they've done is unreasonable. He reminds them, letter A, what we did was show kindness to a cripple. You see, there is a sense that people judge, oh, you hate people. You know, we're Christians. We really don't hate. Yes, you're hateful. You know, we're really not. Uh, oh, the way you mistreat people, you Christians. You know, we don't really mistreat people. We love people. We feed them. We give them something to drink. We clothe them. We visit them. We minister to them. We pray for them. We, you know, and you just begin to speak what we do as believers because people are quick to make judgments. Uh, they're quick to present a situation that isn't accurate. And so these men are thrown in jail. You think, wow, they were thrown in jail. What did they do? Oh, they healed a man. Really? And you threw him in jail? Yeah. Because, well, you know, and then they have to explain themselves. So there's this gracious way uh, that they're explaining, but then he presents the truth and he gets it right out there, Jesus. Jesus is the one who healed him. It wasn't our power. It wasn't our godliness. Jesus sovereignly chose to heal this man. 
Now, the reason that's important in witnessing is because our goal as witnesses is to facilitate a discussion between them and Jesus. My goal is to stay out of the way. This is not about me. It's about you and your relationship with God. And you need him. And Jesus is the way to get to him. And I want to encourage you, pray. You don't need to argue with me. This isn't about me. Who am I? I'm just a messenger. I'm, I'm sitting here telling you a wit. I'm giving you a witness for Christ. But our goal, and I'll tell you this, this is absolutely relieving. You, you're not the center. You're not the attention. The whole idea is getting people to talk to God. Get him in relationship with God. And that really is liberating. And that's what he does. It's not about us. So he begins to share the gospel message. And he rehearses what they did, that you rejected Jesus as the Messiah. But understand, we understand the reason you did that. Because of the Old Testament, you didn't understand the purpose of the Messiah. They judged Jesus and said, if he was the Messiah, he would have stopped his death. The fact that he couldn't stop the death shows he wasn't the Messiah. And Peter comes along and says, no, 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 no. God had a purpose in the death. Understand, the Messiah came to die. What? The Messiah came to die. And he died and he paid for your sins. That's why he died. The proof of his resurrection wasn't in stopping the death, but in having victory over the death and God raised him from the dead, proving he was the Messiah. Now we're going to learn next week as we continue the dialogue that they don't even have an answer for that. It's like they just go, get out, get out. And they remove them and then they start talking like, what are we going to do? I mean, they don't even have an answer. They're just awed at the way they have reasoned with them. Well, we know that they're hardened to the message. And so the question is, you and I are going to meet people that are hardened to the message of the gospel. They don't want to hear it. So what do we tell them? Well, what did he tell him? Look at verse 11. In speaking of Jesus, he is, and then he quotes the Bible. And I put that down. He is the stone the builders rejected. He's become the cornerstone. That was a prophecy about the Messiah. So they knew he was talking about the Messiah. And, uh, and that's the message, the lesson. Always use God's word that way you're keeping the focus on God and his word. You say they're accusing the disciples of abandoning the faith. But that he's going to the Old Testament, their Bible, and he's quoting it, and he's explaining it because they haven't rightly understood it. And so if someone wants to argue with you, he says, listen, I'm not here to argue with you. I'm just here to tell you what God says in his word. And so if you're going to argue, argue with God. You don't need to argue with me. I'm just the messenger. And uh, so he explains the Old Testament, and, um, and then they begin to wonder what they're saying and there's a question about it and he's explaining of what Christ did and so he uses that Old Testament prophecy from Psalm 118 and he quotes the builders you're the religious leaders you rejected that's how you responded to Jesus the stone was Jesus and the cornerstone is who Jesus revealed himself to be now that word for cornerstone it means the chief stone on which all else depends. It's the most important stone. It's the very head of the corner from which the building is built. So he says, Jesus is the cornerstone. What does that mean? Verse 12, that's the summation. Verse 12, salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And that's the last lesson. When you're witnessing, don't stray from the gospel. And I want to encourage you. If you say, you know, Pastor Jim, I'm a newer believer. Or I, I'm not sure how much of the Bible I understand. I want to, my go-to verse is John 3.16. When I'm witnessing to someone and maybe I'm not quite sure what to say, when in doubt, quote the word that makes God the authority, that makes his word, and the word of God is living and active. It pierces the heart. And just say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And hopefully you've memorized John 3, 16, and use that word because it is powerful. You say, oh, they know. They don't know. 
They're blind. They're bound. Uh, they're, they can't hear. And so you and I are the messengers and we speak it. You say, do we say it again? Say it again. We don't know how long you need to say it, but keep saying it. And so let's just finish up with verse 12. What was he saying? Salvation is found in no one else. Jesus is the Messiah. There's not another one coming. He came. The promised Savior arrived. He's Christ the Lord. He's the cornerstone. And then there's no other name under heaven. There's no other way to be saved. Under heaven is the entire world. In every possible religion, there's no other name, no other one who can save you. Jesus is the one given to men. God sent Jesus as the Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through him. And Jesus is the way by which we must be saved. That word is, he is necessary for salvation. Religion won't save you. Your goodness will not save you. Your good works will not save you. Your baptism, your Lord's Supper, those things will not save you. Jesus saves. The words by which we must means there is need of. It behooves us. It is right and proper. It behooves all of us to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved from our sins. To have our sins permanently erased because of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross for us. I finish with one last scripture. I saw a great white throne and him who is seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and I saw the dead. Every human being, important and insignificant, standing before the throne. And the book was opened, which is the book of life. It's the Lamb's book of of eternal life. It's the names of those who have been saved. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That is why it behooves you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And that's why it behooves us to tell others the glorious news of the gospel that perhaps God would save them as well. Let's pray. Thank you for honoring God and his word. And now in these holy moments, would you pray to God? Affirm your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you're here this morning and you've never received Christ, call upon him now. Turn from your sin and whatever you're trusting in to save you and turn to Jesus. He will surely save you. Call upon him now. Pray to him. And if you've been remiss in being a bold and courageous witness for Christ, Perhaps in these moments, you would ask the Lord to fill you with his spirit and give you boldness to be a good witness, to be an outspoken, gracious witness, to think of the people he's put in your life or will put in your life. It's not a coincidence. Tell them. Ask for an opportunity to share with them. Even just share John 3.16. And let that living word perhaps become alive to them. For every way that you are a good witness, thank you. I commend you. Praise his name.